I am Jim Collison, and live from our virtual studios around the world, this is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on May 25th, 2021. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. And today, never more important uh, on that topic. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. There's a link right above our video there to allow you to log in. If you have questions after the fact, and many of you will listen to the recorded version of this, you can always send us an email, coaching at Gallup. Dot com. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and you can find us by searching Gallup Webcasts or there on YouTube to make sure you're up to date with everything we're doing. Dr. Jacqueline Robinson is our host today. She works as a learning and development consultant here with me at Gallup. And Jacqueline, always great to see you on a call to coach, and welcome back. Likewise. Thank you. It feels like forever, but I, know. I think it was only two weeks ago, two weeks. <laughs> but we're in this odd time space continuum. Yes. And, oh. and things are going faster. <laughs> we have a very important topic uh, today. So why don't you get us started? Yes. So we have two brilliant humans uh, from Gallup with us today, Christy Rubenstein and Alana Levy. Uh, Christy is the Senior Director of Enterprise Consulting at Gallup. She is responsible for their professional services network of consultants, account leaders, and researcher consultants across the U.S. Um, and her team of managers and consulting professionals advise Fortune 1000 organizations. Christy's top five, in case you're wondering, is strategic, learner, achiever, communication, and positivity. And then with Ilana, welcome Ilana. Uh, she is the Senior Director of Public Sector Consulting at Gallup. So she oversees the implementation of Gallup's global public sector uh, client engagement and focuses on expanding those strategic partnerships with governments, multilateral organizations, and philanthropic foundations. Ilana's top five are strategic, maximizer, individualization, ideation, and learner. So we'll talk a little bit today about some of these overlaps with their themes. Um, welcome, you two ladies. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. Thank you. Thank so you. One of the things we wanted to talk about today, we know it, it marks an important day in U.S. history and across the world. It was something that um, impacted a lot of people and, and started to create some conversation. Um, we know today is the anniversary of George Floyd's uh, death. And so, Christy, I know you had some some beautiful words just to, to help us think through this today. Yes. That's right, Jacqueline. Today marks a year since uh, George, George Floyd was killed, and it was an event that compelled our country to condemn injustice and discrimination. And many additional details of those agonizing moments surrounding George Floyd's death have recently been released. And with today being the anniversary of the event, we just wanted to take time to acknowledge it and also just to reiterate our support uh, of each other and take time to even connect with our teams. So this morning here in Chicago, we held a town hall uh, where we did take some time to acknowledge uh, that it was the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death and uh, just be there to reiterate our support of each other and also take a moment to reaffirm the value that we have to cultivate a workplace that uh, makes equity and diver uh, diversity and inclusion and openness a priority within uh, the the walls of of our Gallup offices here in Chicago and uh, through through the the Gallup uh, community abroad. So uh, we just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge that today and uh, and think about um, how we can support each other along this journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially as we talk about this uh, teams. So really connecting with with teams today, with individuals on teams, and just checking in with one another and seeing how they're doing. Um, and that really takes us to this past year, um, their, the remote work environment, COVID-19, um, George Floyd's death. There's been a lot that's happening. So ladies, how have you encouraged cross collaboration and communication where people can lean on one another, um, for tough times like this, but also actively cross collaborate when it comes to task oriented work? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'll jump in and, and thank you, Christy. That was beautifully stated, I think, about your own personal uh, commitment and reflecting Gallup's commitment um, to 
learning from this really painful episode to make a better workplace and a better future. So thank you for that. You know, I think that this whole past year has been this incredible journey and and almost leadership and management laboratory for all of us. Um, You know, fundamentally, I think in everything um, that we've done, we've needed to foster, I think, a culture of intentionality around communication, because being remote, we really lost, I think, a lot of the spontaneity um, that you would typically have in a workplace. And I've been thinking a lot about it from sort of the the manager, um, team member types of interactions where some of the the managers um, that we lead and that we help coach uh, managing remote employees was a new experience. So um, I think we've really been focused heavily on how do you make um, kind of one-on-one remote conversations meaningful, proactive, forward-looking? How do you encourage people to not just speak about sort of their tactical needs in the workplace, but how this um, experience of the pandemic is affecting their well-being, their outlook, their relationship with work, and what are they looking for in the future? I think one of the things that we're learning is that the United States and the world, I think, is going through a time of just reflection. What do you want out of your job? What do you want out of a manager? How do you want your career to develop? And I think that those who were most able to succeed in terms of communication were able to foster trust, build even stronger bonds, and take their relationships to the next level, even though it was remote. And it, you know, I think it's it's very, very difficult to strike that balance um, in a manager relationship between the tactical and the proactive and meeting people where they are. And we could talk more about that um, throughout the show, but I think that that's been, for me at least, um, a major kind of theme of the last year. How do we strengthen and build um, management skills for those that are supervising and coaching remote workers for the first time? I, I just love what you said there because that's we've seen that we've seen that with some of the engagement data working with organizations. Um, if they don't have the skill set and they're not keeping it top of mind, this past year especially, we've seen a reduction in maybe the growth and development um, mm-hmm. engagement items where people don't feel like they're able to expand and be stretched in the workplace or like that career path that they were seeing for themselves is no longer um, a path. It looks almost blurry because they haven't had those conversations with management. So I just love what you've been touching on because – even in the the series so far, we've talked about the the importance of values, um, mm-hmm. knowing what your values are as an individual, but also as a culture. And what's ahead? Um, what's the year ahead look like for me or for my team or for my organization? What growth and development might I receive? So, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that um, understanding and, you know, I think Christy and I spend a lot of time in our relationship thinking about this is, acknowledging that different individuals on our teams have experienced this seminal year in a really, really different way. So how we're coaching them, um, the kind of future that we're trying to provide a vision for has elements of consistency and common values, but it also sort of needs to meet people where they are knowing that there are a lot of differences. So I think that that's been a, an interesting journey as well. Absolutely. You know, Jacqueline, reflecting on your question, you know, how do you encourage cross collaboration, especially within a remote environment, whether it be around your career path as we're talking about now, or even on other topics, like maybe something's frustrating or, or getting in someone's way of success. And I think that the concept of needing to collaborate means that you have uh, different ideas that you want to mesh together, but it also assumes that there's currently silos where there's different ideas being expressed in different places that you need to bring together. And I think what's unique about being a leader is that we get the opportunity to see across many different groups 
and understand when somebody needs to hear something someone else has to say. And there's been many times where Alana and I have have been very intentional about creating some bridges. So even if you just think about the two groups that we manage, like uh, we, we're all client facing consultants, but the consultants that work in enterprise group are dealing mostly with our fortune you know, 500 companies where Alana's group is focused more on government education and more within within the um, the pub public sector. So where do we see both of our our client facing teams needing to hear the same information or even borrowing ideas from each other? Yes. So uh, part of us being co-leaders allows for us to say, hey, here's what my team's talking about. Uh, what would your team have to say about that? And being able to to borrow each other's skills and talents when that's needed. Yeah. Do you, to your point, how frequently do you all connect with one another to to have that knowledge sharing? We connect formally uh, once a week. We have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, but I would say daily. I think yeah. come <laughs> things come I, up every day. Chris is not in my life uh, in a certain day. It feels like. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder where she is. <laughs> a testament to the best friends at work. You both had iced coffees this morning, <laughs> yes, <laughs> sitting right. in different areas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, uh, Jacqueline, yeah. I know that this is also a, a a session called called to coach, and many people are probably wondering, like, how can I coach people to create a more collaborative environment? Yes. And um, I was was just reflecting on some questions that might be helpful for coaches to ask in order to identify when those bridges need to be made. Yes, so absolutely. even as a manager is thinking about talking with their team members, asking questions like, uh, you know, what do you need help with today, this week, this month? Or perhaps asking, is there anything in your work that's affecting or frustrating you? Sometimes you'll, you'll hear yes. people express things there. Uh, uh, another question that I like is looking back on the last day or week, can you find any part of that day or week that could have been better? Hmm. And maybe that's a softer way to ask them, like what's what's getting in their way that you might be able to, to make a bridge to find a connection to help improve that. And then uh, the last one's a little bit more general, but is there anyone that you want to get to know better on the team or within Gallup? And how can I help you set up time to connect with them virtually? So it might just be as easy as an introductory email but I think as leaders, we have uh, just a large network of people that we talk to mm -hmm. about different topics and uh, that we know have different specializations that we can often be a bridge uh, to help people uh, just simply get connected. And that, that's really all, the, all that you need to do. And then uh, they'll, they'll take the topic and run with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely love that last question, um, especially because as, as both of you have mentioned, you can see high level and you have connections with leaders and managers across the organization. So someone might know that they would like to be connected, but they don't know who that person is. They just know maybe the industry or the skill set and having that knowledge base to create that warm welcome would be so appreciated. Um, yeah, I think that even taps into the learning and growth piece because you're you're helping stretch their knowledge in that degree. I think that's right. And then, you know, listening to Christy, it, it's kind of resonating for me on the collaboration perspective that we can't take for granted that all leaders make it a goal and an objective to collaborate really well. I think in many organizations, there are some kind of territorialism where it comes for leadership. And part of leadership is also um, often about advocating for resources and um, you know, negotiating on budgets and hiring and who gets this and who gets that. And it's not a surprise that in some organizations that devolves, I think, a little bit into a zero sum game. So I think for teams, if they have a leader who is not seen as collaborating or doesn't collaborate um, effectively or doesn't prioritize collaboration, I do think that that trickles down and it's not viewed as an ultimate um, sort of value. You know, another example is I think as a leader, setting the expectation that the way that you treat partners at work, even if they're not on your direct team 
or maybe you're more senior than them, maybe you're more experienced than them, whatever it is, is a value that we do expect um, you to do everything you can to partner and collaborate effectively. And I do think that that needs to come um, from the top. I mean, I've, I think we've all had workplace experiences where we've seen leaders that don't um, collaborate effectively and the negative implications that it can have. And just like they say, you know, about marriages, you you do have to work at it, right? It's not that it just always organically happens. I mean, it's better if you have natural chemistry and if you genuinely like each other. Um, but I think that there are probably leadership instances, um, and, and we're blessed not to have this, where leaders maybe say, you know, I don't really want to be personal friends with this person but they still have to prioritize the effective collaboration. So these little techniques like always making sure that we have weekly one-on-ones, copying um, each other on emails that even if it doesn't feel like directly relevant in the moment, you know, hey, I just want to make sure Christy sees this Mm -hmm. so we can circle back later and I can explain my thinking or hey, you know, I think Christy might not see this the same way. So I want to make sure that we follow up on this. I think we probably both kind of like keep a running list of, oh, you know, here are four things I need to make sure to talk to Christy about this week. Um, And all of that, I think, is intentional. And, you know, we're lucky that we enjoyed doing it. But I think you still have to do it, even if it's not coming from a friendship place. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you for those tips and tricks too, because one thing I was thinking um, with the coaches on is if they're coaching that person that isn't actively cross collaborating or doesn't see the value in it, how can they give them those little nudges so that they've got those tips and tricks to say, it doesn't have to be um, widespread change that you're creating within yourself. It could be you're copying that other leader in at this point in time, but helping them, helping them see the impact of that cross collaboration. And mm-hmm. I, I like your point about leadership too. It has to start with the leader. So if if the coach is coaching that manager or leader and they still don't want to be cross collaborative, can they go to that level or HR to say, I'm really trying here, but can we run a 360 mm-hmm. to give me that extra tool for support so they can see the impact that this is making? Mm-hmm. Um, so I really appreciate the tips. I think that's a, that's really come into play over the last year while we've all been virtual, I think that there's a lot more accidental interactions when you're working with people in person where you might have an opportunity to collaborate because you're getting coffee and you ask someone about what they're working on that day Mm -hmm. and you have a natural uh, intersection where you might be able to collaborate or share a resource or uh, an idea that might help that person. But when you're all connected virtually, you really have to be intentional about it. Uh, even you know, setting up, uh, whenever we have team meetings, we always reserve the last 15 minutes for a breakout session. And we'll usually just through through Zoom, put people into small groups, three or four, let Zoom you know, uh, yeah. disparate, uh, create their own groups. So that way uh, there's totally random who gets hooked up with who and give them a topic to discuss, to have, to kind of force some of those accidental interactions. Um, Great but- idea. You know, one other thing I wanted to mention just about uh, creating cross collaboration and Mm -hmm. and uh, being able to really collaborate. Um, I think that there's sometimes uh, a misconception that just because I got a group of people together to talk about an idea that I collaborated Mm. and to uh, you might even pick some of your best friends at work or people that might be more aligned with agreeing with your plan so that way you can check the box and move forward, especially for those um, achievers in the audience or people that have a lot of execution themes and just want to get it done. Like they, they want to make sure enough people are on board that we can move forward. Like how quickly can we activate yes. on this? But I just wanted to iter- reiterate that collaboration really takes time because mm-hmm. true collaboration means that you're taking time to pick different opinions than the ones that you might be walking into the the idea with and um, being willing to explore the situation from their point of view, have empathy for what they're experiencing, understand how their priorities might be aligned to different objectives than yours Mm -hmm. and willing to 
not have your plan fully baked and and be willing to allow them to add their own perspective and ingredients in order to come up with something that's better in the long run. But that is how uh, we uh, just really get true collaboration is by taking time to ask opinions and really invite more diversity into the conversation and demonstrate inclusiveness by, by asking for other perspectives. And uh, then everyone feels like their opinion could be heard. Uh, there's also a phrase that I live by that uh, people support what they create. Mm -hmm. And if you allow for others to be in the process of creating it with you from the onset, then you'll have a lot less work to do on the back end to try to get everybody on board with your idea. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a matter of shifting that time to the front end uh, when you're actually collaborating and creating the idea. And it's, it's worth slowing down and taking the time uh, as you're building it in order to get collaboration at that phase, then you'll be able to move a lot faster later. Such a great call out. That alone too, I think could help leaders or managers that don't allow for feedback to start allowing for feedback to get that active collaboration in the idea generation. Um, one thing that reminds me of is this tactic I just heard in positive intelligence, which is if someone offers an idea, instead of saying yes, but, yes and and you're building on that idea um, so it reminds me of exactly what you're saying how do we construct this plan together and move towards action where all of our ideas are are pieced in there as opposed to just one person yeah yeah, yeah that is that is a really insightful comment christy i'm reflecting on it about the true collaboration and getting the definition right versus just sort of like bringing groups together and checking out the box and I think that something else that we might have also learned over the last year is because it is hard work, and I really agree with you on that, is what are the areas that require that intensive collaboration and what are the areas where, you know what, sometimes you need to just make some individual decisions um, for the sake of efficiency and speed or you have enough sense that the decision you're going to make will be reasonably accepted by other people. So I think that, you know, that's mm -hmm. interesting. We both have, we both lead with strategic. And I think that that can sometimes help defining what are the areas where we really have to have that collaborative process and buy-in mm -hmm. and where can we just make some executive decisions and move on. And, Getting that right, I mean, sometimes we obviously err on the wrong side and we make a decision that feels like this should not be controversial or require, you know, large scale discussion. But when you get it wrong, stepping back and acknowledging that and then to Christy's point saying, OK, what were the voices that I didn't hear in that decision? Why, why was my instinct wrong and what did I miss and learning from it, I think can be really powerful because I think that it's not reasonable to expect that a leader gets every decision correct. I think what is reasonable to expect is that a leader acknowledges if they made a, sort of a decision that wasn't the best decision and learns from that to establish stronger collaboration and processes moving forward. Here, here. So I just coached um, a manager and it reminds me of what you just said, because because she does that at the, the management level, whenever she is in a one on one with an employee who um, might not be hearing the message of the other person that they're working with, she'll take those experiences that she has and she'll pose those same questions to say, but have you have you thought about it through their side, through their perspective? Um, and they might say, oh, actually, no, I haven't. What might have been going through their minds? How, how would you have preferred the conversation to go? Um, where can you meet in the middle? So mm -hmm. I, I love that we're talking about leadership and management here. Because to one degree, if you're not collaborating and you don't have those effective partnerships, for one, the teams see it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're collaborating and you have those active partnerships, then you have a lot of that wherewithal and the actions and insights and questions to be able to pose to your teams to have them be even more effective and collaborative. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to call that out because I, 
it, from the perspective that you just offered, I saw that kind of in action um, just this past week with with a leader that had this conversation with her with her employee who was um, pretty frustrated at one of the the individuals she was working with, um, mm-hmm. and she posed similar questions. You know, it's it's really interesting, and I know that we're gonna talk a little bit about um, collaboration and and hybrid workplaces and return to work and those interesting topics. Something that I've been thinking about, and I don't know the answer, I don't know if anyone knows the answer, is on some levels, was collaboration uh, more effective remotely? And will will there be some challenges when we're all back to physical workplaces? Or is the reverse true? Because something that I can think about is, you know, Christie's in Chicago, you know, interacting with lots of great Gallup folks. I'm in Washington, D.C., interacting with lots of other great Gallup folks. And in that in-person interaction, it's a lot easier to um, make a decision on the fly based on some, you know, connections that you have there or things that you observe. And I think that sometimes you may forget a little bit to take that step back and say, okay, actually I need to collaborate a little bit more broadly or include voices of people who are not physically located here in order to come to the right decision. So I think that there's clearly going to be advantages um, to return to work, but I think that the that virtual setting where everyone was remote probably did raise the bar on the intentionality of collaboration and we'll just have to think about how we can continue some of those techniques that really worked um, once we're back into those impromptu personal interactions in person. It's good insight. And have you have you ladies thought about what that's going to look like or how you plan to set up the teams for success too? Um, because to your point, communication has changed and intentionality has changed since we've been remote. Do you see that shifting again once people are back in office or some are are hybrid, you know, or some are just fully remote and some are in the office? Is that going to impact communication styles and well-being and burnout and some of those those pieces we were talking about earlier? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we thought about this a lot in Chicago. Uh, we have, you know, a beautiful office here. You can see the, the Chicago mm-hmm. River coming in from Lake Michigan <laughs> and then here it branches north and south. So. We, we have the opportunity to be in a beautiful space together. There's a lot of uh, just physical spaces in our office where we can collaborate and work together, you know, whiteboard rooms, um, treadmill desks, uh, you know, just an open office concept with a, enough of a barrier that you still have, have your own space and can have your own conversations, but you can overhear things happening. So uh, actually last Tuesday was my first day back in the office. And uh, I remember sitting at my desk and overhearing another consultant talk to their clients about uh, Gallup's work in the space of ESG. And it's something that Alana and I have uh, worked with our, our Gallup practice leaders to talk about, you know, what's Gallup's uh, offerings and approach around ESG that we can talk to our clients about. And then we launch an offering like this, and then uh, we don't we don't really hear anything. Uh, because our consultants are out talking with their clients about it. And then a few months later, we'll see a result. Like we'll see a new project come through or an impact that was made at a client. So we kind of see the beginning of it and the end of it. And we miss out on the middle. But Mm -hmm. being in the office, I had an opportunity to hear that consultant talking with their clients about it. And I, it just, it was like such a surprise to see it in action and uh, to know that he was utilizing all of the, the resources at his disposal to be there for his client around this important question that they had. So I want to make sure that we uh, have an opportunity to promote people being in the office. Um, you know, in order to have uh, that kind of interaction, though, you have to show up. And I think that there's a lot of benefits that have been gained from this uh, hybrid environment. So what we're suggesting is that, you know, three to five days a week, you're in the office, depending on what your schedule looks like. And then one day a week, we will have some sort of event that will uh, help people collaborate and have even some social interaction. So that could be a professional event where someone gives a briefing on something they're doing with a client 
to a, a personal event to go out and celebrate someone's work anniversary. Uh, maybe it's celebrating um, a holiday so that way people can okay. feel like themselves at work. So uh, just give them an opportunity to be intentional about connecting. Those are wonderful yeah. ideas. <laughs> Ilana, I think you were going to say something. And I no, I love that. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm jealous. Our, um, <laughs> Our, I think equally beautiful, but differently beautiful Washington, D.C. office is under renovation. Um, it should reopen at the end of June, maybe the beginning of July, which is when I'll go back to the office. But I, I'm definitely at the point now where um, I'm very much looking forward to it. And then the nice thing is, I think this delayed return to work for our Washington, D.C. teams is hopefully just sort of like raising the excitement, limiting the trepidation when we see some of our uh, other Gallup colleagues and, and clients very happily back in the office. And mm -hmm. I think that that vision of the hybrid workplace, what I hope is that it just represents the best of both worlds. You know, Gallup, we've always had a culture of flexibility mm -hmm. and we've always had a degree of a hybrid option, which many people um, utilized. So what I do love about it is I think we're just expanding on our values of what we know drives performance and engagement. And it's not going to be this sort of like wholesale extreme culture change like it is in, in some um, workplaces where there was no uh, remote work before. So I think we've we've done a lot of research. We've We've really studied a lot, particularly about women in the workplace and understanding that flexibility, even when you're working a lot of hours is, you know, hugely, hugely important. Um, and I think our hybrid workplace will allow for that so that the days that you come in, you're really focused, you're engaged, you're happy to be there. And on those days where you have to sort of integrate some childcare aspects or other elements where it makes sense to work from home, that that's also a possibility for you. I think something that you know I'm thinking about that that's probably a little bit unique to my world. Something that I've done in my career, even you know prior to joining Gallup, that I that I really love is um, managing teams outside of the United States. And our our public sector work is is really global. So we have employees, you know, in Europe. We have employees in Asia that are are fully integrated as members of our team. But I think that um, something that's, that's important is making sure that those that don't have the possibility of an interacting in person are not overlooked in this transition back to the workplace um, because they're highly, highly valued members of our team. But I think we have to strike that right balance of um, celebrating all those moments where our city centers are um, able to be back together. And I agree with Christy, when you make it um, worth people's while and you celebrate together and you have um, happy hours and lunches and great recognition activities, it encourages people to go in and be present. And that's so important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, certain segments of Gallup's workforce continue and will remain to be um, remote. And it's not because of COVID. It's because of, of where they were located pre-COVID or, or even decisions that they made during COVID to move. So I think yeah. it's, it's about striking that right balance because Gallup has amazing talent. Um, one of our most important responsibilities is to develop, engage, and retain that talent. And some of that talent will continue to be fully remote. So we need to make them feel as valued and as part, as much a part of our culture as those um, you know, that are in city centers. And we know that just the, the world is changing where in-person business travel it's going to take a long time to get back to the levels it was mm -hmm. pre-COVID. So we don't know what the future looks like in terms of, you know, bringing people across uh, offices and countries together in person. So I think we'll have to really be intentional about um, that hybrid engagement and like creating recognition and celebration activities where in-person and remote employees can celebrate together and be integrated together. 
Here, here. We're really hearing the work-life integration take place where your personal life is just as important and valuable as your professional life. And this experience that we found ourselves in has really um, maybe pulled back the the curtains for some managers mm -hmm. who might not have been attuned to that before to say, okay, let's think about your scheduling. What is going to work for you? Where you feel like you have a better work-life integration. Um, I won't take work-life work balance. I know it's it's always like this these days, but where they're they're more attuned to that. And I really heard that with what you're saying too, and that individualized piece. Mm -hmm. I think you can also be intentional about what meetings you're planning on what days. So if I know I'm going to be in the office every Tuesday and Wednesday, then that's when I'm planning my one-on-ones with the people that are here in the Chicago office. If I know I'm going to be remote Thursday, Friday, then that's when I'm planning my meetings with my people that I'm connecting with virtually. And I, I also uh, don't have any problem doing things twice. So if I need to do you know, a team meeting with the people that are here in Chicago, and then the next hour do another team meeting with those that are virtual in order to make sure that even the way that I'm communicating the message might be different. When someone in a virtual setting is staring into you know, a conference room and they can like barely see the person who's talking, it's <laughs> yes. really engaging for, for the people that are remote. So um, luckily, you know, with communication number four, I love to talk. So I have no, no <laughs> problem just doing the meeting a second time. <laughs> Talent in action. No, it's a that's a really good point because in the old days that's what we did the old days a year ago <laughs> it's you know if people were remote you just you're going to be on that conference line you'll just be on the phone or you're going to be zoomed and you'll just see the little bitty faces but we can do it differently now well, well hopefully we've learned a little bit about i i always felt the remote experience was subpar uh, up until a year ago you always mm -hmm. you were kind of a second class citizen yes you you were on the fringe of the conversation you were there but you weren't really engaged and I, and i hope we don't as we come back we don't forget what that used to be and so we continue mm -hmm. yeah. to because when when we were all and i'm going to ask you guys i'm going to pivot on this question really quick here for a second but when we were all having to do it i think we understood the plight of the person who is on the fringe we were all on the fringe for a while in that actually made some of our virtual meetings better. It made my job a lot easier because mm -hmm. everybody got better at this medium. Like before, a year ago, I was like, uh, it was hit or miss. Now <laughs> everybody is good at this. And so and, and that's a blanket statement. Um, Christy, I want to ask you this question. You know, sometimes though, we as we talk about coming back, it's a little, that, that, that comes from a statement of almost a little bit of privilege. In other words, we've had the ability to go home. It, we've had the ability to work from home. Not everyone's done that. I think there's a group in the population that's like, hey, wait a minute. I, I've still been at work the whole time. Like I had, I was an essential worker or I was in a, I was in a role where I couldn't, this thing manufacturing, right? Can't be done that way. What kind of advice are we giving for those managers, workers, when we think about collaboration in spaces that didn't get this opportunity, that didn't do this, are we giving them any different advice as, there's this mass return back to the office. Is there any different advice for them, for those that are still, that have just continued to be on site? Yeah. Um, well, I always go back to, uh, you know, asking first a question of how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And then second, uh, do you have what you need? And, you know, perhaps there are things that have changed in terms of uh, how people are doing like as things progress within the world around them, that it's good to, to touch base on that, that question again. And then in terms of, do you have what you need? Uh, you know, are there other things that could support them in, uh, in the, the current work that they're doing, or maybe they've seen other possibilities that, that they hadn't seen before that, uh, that they have observed elsewhere that could be incorporated into their current work environment. So, um, just being open to asking good questions as a manager. And uh, I think those two are open-ended enough that you might uh, make some discoveries along the way. That's good. And Lana, would you, would you add anything to that? Yeah, it's a, well, it's a great question. And that was a great answer. And I think that you it's almost like you have maybe three types of workplaces. This is probably an oversimplification, but you, you have a workplace like Gallup where everyone with very, very, very few exceptions were privileged enough to be able to work um, remotely during COVID. So I think 
in our language, it does feel appropriate to have the lens of like this great return. Then you have um, organizations like a hospital, and, and we do have you know health system clients where 85 to 90 percent of their employees never had the luxury of returning from home. And of course, I think your messaging is going to be completely targeted differently, where you're actually hopefully reflecting on that from a point of pride, you know, so the healthcare heroes and you gave of yourself to make this society safe and you were brave enough to come in when others weren't. And I can imagine, and we're seeing this in some of our clients that healthcare obviously had an enormously um, difficult time during the pandemic, but their, their standing in the population now I think is soaring, or you look at like the image of pharma from what they were able to do with the creation and you know testing a vaccine so quickly. So hopefully it can be a point of pride. And and I've you know even read some great articles about um, grocery store workers who sometimes feel and have interactions where they feel not respected, but great managers have also and great leaders have said no, you are an essential worker. You provided for the American people and allowed them to continue to have food and supplies and you too are a hero. And I can imagine that's amazing. I think what's going to be hard, if I had to guess, is those organizations that have both. So I think in manufacturing, you have people who are on the um, factory floor, but then you have lots and lots of, you know, managers and accountants and technologists and people who didn't have to come in. And I um, I think that that will be, that will require some exceptional leadership to get those messaging correct. I love what Christy was saying about she's willing to do um, <laughs> the same meeting twice to get the messaging perfect and to tailor it. Um, I'm inspired by that. I've never thought about it that way, but I think in organizations with that hybrid reality, that that is probably what it will take to to be generous and thoughtful enough with your messaging that you're consciously trying to tailor it and put in that extra effort to do so. Christy, any follow up to that as you, in, in things that you heard Alana say? Would you add any more to it? Mm. Uh, well. I think what it brought to mind was the idea that people like to hear why, uh, how they are a part of the organization's overall mission. So one of our questions that we we ask around assessing employee engagement or is the mission or purpose of my job makes me feel my job's important. And I think that that, that second half of the question is one that often leaders and, and managers miss. They think that it's about talking about the mission of the organization overall, and they forget about the second half of the question, which is about translating it to what the person is doing to contribute to that mission. And this might be a time where they need to hear that. And um, so so be reminded of, of the impact that they make and uh, how each person is, is a part of that. And that doesn't come from leaders because a leader can't uh, always tailor that message to each individual. It really comes from manager being able to translate that vision into helping each person see how their unique contribution feeds into the overall mission. And in this case, you know, if they're an essential worker feeds into, uh, you know, just the, the safety and uh, ability for our, uh, our country to get back on, on our feet and, and begin to, to flourish again. So um, it's, it's a good time to be regrouping on those messages. Thanks for letting me take that little tangent. I felt, you know, <laughs> over the year on Call to Coach here, we often, we've spent a lot of time talking about remote working because it's, that has, it's been our experience. Yeah. But I, I have to remember, you know, my, my wife goes in every day. She works in healthcare and she goes in every day. And so that experience, we completely flipped roles. Like, you know, mm -hmm. she used to be home all the time mm -hmm. and I was out at the office and, and that flipped completely. Um, and so it just gave us new opportunities, you know, gave us new opportunities to think and new opportunities to collaborate. Even at the family level, I'm collaborating in my relationship with her much differently than we collaborated just a year and a half ago. I think as we return or we go back or however that's, you know, the, how organizations in Alana, I really appreciated the hybrid organization that has manufacturing people that have to be there, back mm -hmm. office folks that don't. I appreciate that challenge. 
I think from a collaboration standpoint, we're going to have to rewrite the rules in some hmm. regards of how this works. And so that makes this conversation very important. Yeah. Jacqueline, I'll, I'll throw it back to you for more questions. Yeah, I'd love to hear um, what we might have from our folks in the coaching community. In the chat room, we'll give them. In uh, the we'll, chat room, yeah, we'll give them a second <laughs> to uh, to respond um, back to that. Um, as we're waiting for some of those questions in the pre-show, we had a little bit of a strengths conversation between mm -hmm. the two of you, and uh, I was just on a webcast the other day where we all had Maximizer. It was funny, all four of mm -hmm. us. I was looking for that here today. We don't, but. Uh, you guys, you guys had mentioned you both have strategic, but that plays out in a different kind of in a different, um, oh, well, just in, in the way in, in your leadership path, Alana, as you think about strategic with all your other themes around it, how does that play out? And then Christy, I'm going to ask the same thing of you. Like, how does that play out in your decision making process? Well, that's a great question. And I think that for me, um, the strategic theme, I think, helps me narrow in pretty quickly on what I think are the most important challenges to tackle or prioritization of um, focus for us. And also, I think helps you see the end in sight. So you're not getting stuck in the tactics. So let's talk about like learning and development for roles. It can be tempting, I think, without the strategic theme to obsess over the tactics of, is it this course or that course or this framework or that framework? But obviously the big picture is helping create a culture where our talent feels that they're evolving in their role and acquiring the experiences and the skills um, to serve our clients better and to progress. And if, if you forget that end in sight, then I think you can get really kind of mired down in the tactics. The tactics are important, but what it's all leading to, in my mind, is even more important. So that, that's sort of how I leverage it. I think that um, there's a very interesting dynamic about individualization and strategic, in my mind, because one of you know, leadership styles, there's there's some who focus heavily on consistency mm -hmm. and there are some who focus on kind of individualized paths. So with the strategic, if you know what the outcome is, to me, it's easier to individualize because, you know, maybe this person doesn't want to have this traditional developmental framework, but they want to end up in the same place, but they're going to do it a little bit differently. I think that that helps. If you individualize though, without that strategic big picture, you're just, it's, it's just chaos sometimes, so. Mm. No, it's good. Christy, talk a little bit about then how you see your strategic working for success. Yeah, so I actually see my strategic as working as a very structured way of thinking. So when I hear about um, a problem, I'll often generate a solution that is a structure that most people will be able to um, work within. And then uh, I think what Alana is saying is without that structure in place, then you can't really iterate off of the core. So for example, around um, account leader development. So our account leaders are our consultants at Gallup that are responsible for the key like point of contact for our client relationships. So we want to continuously uh, develop them. So we created a framework where we expect for them to build their expertise, deliver excellence, and generate growth for our clients. And then all of the learning opportunities that we have for them are fitting into the framework within those three levels. And then we uh, iterate what that looks like in terms of uh, the level of that consultant. From when they first joined Gallup, what does it look like to develop expertise? You know, in your in your third or fourth year, what does that look like? In your seventh or eighth year, what does that look like? In your fifteenth year, what does that look like? So, being able to uh, have a core and common framework mm -hmm. and then customize for each person where it counts uh, is how we are able to kind of leverage some of that strategic thinking along with putting on the, an individual perspective on it. I love hearing your themes work together, <laughs> like <laughs> just how they work separate, and then to Jim's point. Um, 
in our pre pre show when it was just uh, the the four of us talking, hearing how your your themes interact together. Mm -hmm. um, you all are just so brilliant. <laughs> we uh, and I'll remind uh, those listening. We did an interview with you guys back in mm -hmm. August of 2020. We really zeroed in on your your job role and how you work together. And so, if you want to get some additional, if you if you didn't get a chance to hear that, go back uh, August 2020. Um, and, and as we talked about um, working together on that, you can get a whole nother hour with Christy and Alana. Um, I want to ask you this question. So, Micah and I, you know, we partner a lot, and I'm partnering. Uh, with Jacqueline a lot more this year, but Mike and I were, were coming up with some summit ideas, some things we wanted to do during our breakout. And we have this rule with each other that we'll say like, okay, just ideas. These are just ideas. No, no, <laughs> you know, no one is like, if it's a bad idea, it's okay. If it's a good idea. And we'll just, we'll continue just to spout things in, in, in our partnership until a few really good ideas come to light. It works well because we both have a high ideation. We've got high activator in it. Like that works for us. Do you guys have some, like, do you have some partnership things that you can kind of land on all the time that say, we're going to go to this place to be really effective and mm -hmm. kind of call it that? Do you, do you kind of have any spaces like that where you, you really start kind of activating it? That's probably the wrong word to use, but um, talk a little bit about that. Do you have any of those any of those kinds of systems as partners that you rely on? That's a good question. I mean, I think that you know we're we're lucky that the getting work done together, I think, has evolved really naturally in the and I think that because we have that shared strategic and even if it manifests differently, what I think did not manifest differently was, I think we were able to agree relatively quick, quickly what were the most important things to tackle. And I think where it could have been difficult was if Christy said, you know, for our, our full integrated group, these are the top three things we have to make progress on this year. And then I was saying, I completely disagree with all those top three things. It's three other things. Luckily that, that hasn't happened at all. Um, I do think, though, a place where we can be very powerful together is on the relational side. So, for instance, I think that because it's natural to invite each other to some sensitive meetings, even if we're not the ones driving it, like it would be very rare that Christy would have a meeting and someone would say, well, why would you invite Alana? Why is she here? Or vice versa. I can kind of be a fly on the wall when I'm not center stage. Um in a meeting, and I think Christy trusts my relational skills where I can step back and say, okay, your framework was perfect, your presentation was perfect, everything was perfect, but what I think you missed was there's a lot of tension between these two people and you know their significance is getting in the way and that's why we're not moving forward. Or Christy can sit in a you know exit interview for someone that was primarily my responsibility in terms of management and kind of hear the feedback really objectively and say, okay, I didn't know you well, I didn't know your world well, but here's what I'm taking from that experience and here's the commitment that we can make together to sort of drive that forward. And I think that's really beneficial and powerful and it's, it's pretty rare. So we can process the intangibles together um, really well and and we there are certain experiences where really only the two of us have mm -hmm. and and you need a best friend at work to, you know to be able to call and say did you just hear what i heard and like <laughs> what's going on in those dynamics because if i don't get that right i'm gonna you know i'm not gonna be effective in this particular instance so i'm i'm very grateful for that mm -hmm. oh absolutely i think having you know, a co-leader has been just, uh, it just gives you so much uh, permission to like be candid in conversations and even admit, this is hard. I'm not sure what to do. Mm -hmm. Can you help me think through it? Or here's the approach that I want to take with that. How do you think that's going to land? And there's no uh, judgment. It's, there's oh. no like there's no way that you can fail when you're talking to your friend about it who's equally as responsible as you. So exactly. <laughs> it's nice to have, you know, a teammate 
who's uh, who's who's working towards the same goal that you can, can have those hard conversations with. Uh, but I think a lot of our uh, discussions also come up when we see a shared issue. Like so many organizations complain about the lack of knowledge management. Mm. And at Gallup, you know, as a research firm with all of the books that we've studied and all the topics that we've covered here on Call to Coach, uh, we have a lot of information. So we, our problem with knowledge management is certainly not uh, knowledge. It's, it's the actual <laughs> management of that knowledge. So what Alana and I said was, you know, we don't need any more books in the library. We just need more librarians. We need people who really know uh, everything that's available and can help other people navigate through that. So, um, you know, Alana knew someone kind of personally in the DC office who uh, was really good at kind of organizing and, and uh, putting information in in a way that can be easily resourced or easily accessible by others. So uh, maybe you have people that actually go to the container store and buy those containers and actually use them to organize their homes, like people with this natural talent for organizing information. Uh, so we identified a few of those on our teams and then we put them into roles where they can uh, utilize that talent to help organize information around knowledge management in a way that's easy for others to uh, access and then be the librarian there to help get that information. So, you know, we came up with a problem. We, we knew what type of solution that we needed to make and then between our our two networks were able to figure out who to who to place within that structure to make it come together. I just I just heard your strategic in there. That's pretty great. As you're <laughs> yeah. Walking through that framework, very very um, very clear. I'm going to reserve the right to bring you guys back next year about this time and do a follow up to like, okay, how did it really go? This has been the fun part for my job is that. Things have been changing so fast uh, year over year. If you interview every year, every six months, there's enough <laughs> new things. So that you, true. You know, we're we're kind of learning <laughs> all the time. Um, Jacqueline, let's take a second to thank our guests for coming today, would you? Thank you, ladies. Um, you know, the the chat has appreciated this. I've been looking at the comments and the questions coming in, and your feedback has just been so, so helpful. Um, I learned something new. I think everybody in chat learned something new as we think about cross collaboration and partnerships um, with teams, but also between managers and between leaders. Uh, so thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Um, for those listening in, we will have our final episode on improving teams coming up in June with Rachel Breck and Sarah Vander Helm, and they will be talking about celebrating successes. Uh, so we're going to end on that positive, happy note after we're coming out of this this year we've all been through. Uh, right and thank, you, thanks again, ladies. Hang tight <laughs> for me one second. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all those resources. And Christy just said we, we don't have a lack <laughs> of resources that's out there. <laughs> Facts. Uh, now in, in Gallup Access. So to gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths. Uh, and actually upper left-hand corner, uh, drop the menu down and choose resources. And you can search. We have a ton of stuff available for you there. So get in there and get that done. If you're interested in coaching, master coaching, or you want to become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, which would be great for 2021, uh, we could use a few more of those as well. You can contact us. Send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget, if you want to stay up to date on all the webcasts that we're doing, including when we have Alana and Christy back next year, follow us on Eventbrite, gallup.eventbrite.com. There's still time to join us for the 2021 Gallup at Work Summit, and it's going to be pretty great. So you're going to want to be there, gallupatwork.com, uh, and you can still get registered. you got, a, I think, two weeks from today is when it kicks off. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you get that done. And then, of course, join us on any social platform, and who wouldn't? Uh, just search Clifton Strengths on those platforms, and you can find us there. We want to thank you for listening today. We'll send you back to your next virtual meeting, <laughs> whatever that might be. <laughs> With that, we'll say goodbye.